A murder without a motive. A killer the prosecution said was so twisted, he hatched the ultimate role play with fantasy gamers. They told us how many times she was stabbed. I knew immediately. 55 stab wounds, the knife left in her neck. And I said, we think it's her husband. Mr. Faria. Just like that, everything came together. Yeah, I'll give you why. I thought that's the only person it could be. The victim was already dying. We found out in October of 2011 that the breast cancer had gone to her liver. I thought, oh my gosh, that's a death sentence. The husband now serving his own sentence, life in prison. I was pleased with the outcome and think that justice was served. This may not be an open and shut case. The case is under appeal and the prosecution is not talking. As we look into questions about the Faria case that never came up in trial. Welcome to our special report, the Faria murder. A joint investigation combining the resources of Fox 2 and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. We began this investigation more than two months ago after a jury convicted husband Russ Faria for murdering his wife Betsy. We've examined evidence as we've looked into nagging questions you'll see unfold for the first time. Lincoln County 911. Two days after Christmas, 2011. Russ Faria called 911, said he thought his wife Betsy killed herself. I don't, I wish she do this to me. A medical examiner said she was stabbed 55 times, her arms nearly severed, most of the stabbings after she was dead. A crime of passion. When you stab somebody over 50 times, it's usually a crime of passion, a husband or wife. I felt right away it was, his, it was Russ. The immediate suspect, the husband, Russ Faria. For the first time, you're hearing and seeing evidence like the 911 tape and interrogations. You have no, been stabbed over 25 times. Oh Russ. my God, no. 25 times. Over 25 times. And they're not done yet. They're still old. They're still counting. The major case squad questioned him for days. God is in this room with us right now. And God knows that I did not do this. He did not back down. I did not do this. I did not do it. In our joint investigation with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Robert Patrick and I interviewed Russ Faria in prison. It's less than three months after a jury convicted him. Did you kill Betsy? No, no, I didn't. You know, I loved her. I would never and could never do anything like that to anybody, let alone somebody that I love. Evidence techs did not find a drop of blood on him. Police did find these bloody slippers in a closet and a light switch that appeared to be flipped with something bloody. How do you explain bloody slippers? Well, um, judging by the way that they looked, you know, it appeared to me that they looked like they were dipped. Only those slippers and no bloody footprints. I hadn't even been wearing my slippers. And then I'm told that they were in my closet, which I never put them in my closet. Defense attorney Joel Schwartz added they found no evidence of cleanup. They took the pipes to look for blood. There was no evidence of a shower that night. There was no evidence of blood anywhere in the shower or in the drain pipes. In trial, the state focused on Faria's demeanor. Lincoln County Prosecutor Leah Askey told jurors he never needed a Kleenex. We also asked Faria why he appeared emotionless during our prison interview. Well, I've put a lot of things behind me. I've made peace with a lot of things. I've shed a lot of tears. When she was diagnosed both times with cancer, um, you know, I loved her. I love her still. You know, I didn't kill her. Four alibi witnesses said Russ was with them from 6 to 9 p.m. in O'Fallon, Missouri. The drive from their house to Troy puts Faria home within minutes of him making the 911 call. A call Betsy's family believes is telling. Your wife is laying there dead. I mean, you, you'd be bawling. You'd be hard to communicate with. I mean, he would stop. I mean, sh she'd ask him a question and he'd stop, answer it, and then start right back up with this wailing. How could he think it was suicide? She had threatened it previously. She had actually tried it previously, you know, left notes and that. Um, my mind wasn't working right. You know, I saw slashes on her arms and I jumped to conclusions. He said he knew police would focus on him. He's the husband, 
But even sitting in prison after a jury convicted him and a judge sentenced him to life, he says he would not change how he handled it. Schwartz said Faria would not take time served on a misdemeanor. Really? Yeah. He didn't kill his wife. Schwartz said he told prosecutors they had a case, but not against Russ. Our counter was, appoint me as a special prosecutor and let me prosecute the right person, and I'll guarantee you a conviction. This is where the case takes a twist as we reveal suppressed evidence. St. Louis Post-Dispatch reporter Robert Patrick joins me now. He worked with me on this investigation and published this front page story in Sunday's paper. In trial, Russ's motive for murder did not come out, but Betsy's family believes he did have motive. Betsy's sister told me that she believes Russ found out that Betsy was making life insurance plans. Tell me about some of these plans that she was making. Well, one of Betsy's friends told me that she was very reluctant to accept her fatal cancer diagnosis, but eventually came around to, to understand that she was going to have to make videos, going to have to say goodbye to people. She was planning on making some videos to say, say things to her, her daughters during milestones of their lives, and also parcel out the proceeds of her life insurance at those same milestones, you know, X thousand dollars when, when one graduates from college, you know, 10,000 here to buy a car, that sort of thing. And in these conversations, did anything come up about a fear of Russ? No. Nobody that I ever spoke to said that, that Betsy was afraid of Russ. I mean, they, they, they fought, their relationship was up and down, but no one said to me um, that, that she was afraid of him. So the insurance proceeds was more about leaving a lasting legacy, that the money would be used for a positive, lasting memory. Right, right. Some people have told me that she was afraid that Russ would be too distraught to spend the money wisely or fail to spend the money wisely, and that's why she gave somebody else the, the responsibility. And you asked Russ in our prison interview about whether he knew about any change in beneficiary, and here's that clip. Why was she changing insurance beneficiaries at that point? I have no idea. I didn't even know until after I was arrested that that had happened. Betsy's family and closest friends were also surprised about the life insurance change. Was there any evidence that uh, Russ did find a change in a policy? I don't believe that the police found any evidence in the house of the insurance policy. And in fact, um, I don't think anybody was really initially clear on, on who was the beneficiary of that policy. And there's a bigger reason why this life insurance did not come up in trial. It would open the door for evidence we're about to show you. What the timeline revealed about Betsy Faria's murder, including evidence kept from the jury and a surprise phone call to a juror right after the guilty verdict. We will continue our special report, The Faria Murder, a woman who seemingly had no enemies. I don't think she ever knew a stranger, which is really hard to accept this because everybody loved Betsy. You did not go anywhere with her and not have a good time. The murder of a dying woman first looked like a simple case. The husband claimed he found her dead, calling it suicide. But his wife was stabbed 55 times. Prosecutors convinced the judge to keep some evidence from jurors. But it's all in the court record. Betsy Faria was dying. Her friend Kathleen Meyer said Betsy had just come to terms with it and was content. Her family would get a life insurance payout. Policies that will take care of my husband and my daughters. She said, so when, I'm, when I die, they will be well taken care of. That was Betsy, always thinking of others, even hoping to raise money for another family battling cancer. And so this was gonna be a legacy for her to leave um, something like this behind in her memory. She remembers Betsy being ecstatic. They'd raised a lot of money. I don't know how they collected the $10,000 she said they collected, but they weren't a for, they weren't an organization that could give a tax reimbursement yet. Kathleen says Pam Hupp, Betsy's friend, went door to door with Betsy, passing out this flyer in December, just weeks before Betsy died. This is where our timeline begins. Court records show on December 23rd, four days before the murder, Pam and Betsy went to the Winghaven Library together. There, they had a librarian witness them signing a change of beneficiary form for Betsy's life insurance policy. The new beneficiary for that $150,000 policy, Pam Hupp. It didn't make any sense to me at all. I had no knowledge of this um, until the insurance company was investigating the payout. According to records from State Farm, less than a month after the murder, a detective gave the go-ahead to the insurance company, saying 
Mr. Faria is currently in custody. Months later, that same detective appeared friendly in this follow-up interview with Hupp. You now have this money and have not turned any of this money over to the family or the kids. That's correct. That's a huge problem. Betsy has told you that she wants you to hold on to this money to make sure that the family, the, the girls are taken care of, yet they haven't seen a dime of that money. You still have it. The detective asked again about the day of the murder, December 27th, 2011. Betsy was with her friend Bobby Wan at Betsy's chemo that afternoon. Court records indicate Betsy texted Hupp to tell her she didn't need a ride, she was with an old friend, and texted, had not spent any one-on-one -on -one with her. But Hupp suddenly showed up at this chemo treatment. Betsy's friend said she was surprised and Hupp took Betsy home later that night. Then, just hours before the murder, Betsy texted Russ, Pam Hupp wants to bring me home to bed. Pam told the court she drove Betsy from Lake St. Louis to Troy, arriving after 7 p.m. According to court records, Betsy's daughter called to tell her mom she'd need to pick up her phone soon to authorize a family plan cell phone. Betsy did not pick up, not at 721, 726, or 730. Hupp told police she was gone by then. Listen on this audio tape recorded the morning after the murder. We called my husband when we got there. And you called him for what reason? To tell him we were there. He wanted to know when I was, I don't really drive at night too much. Did you go inside? Uh, no. First, she said no. Then a major case squad investigator asked again. So did you ever go, actually go inside the house? I did. Well, we just went in. She turned on the hall light. Police asked about another call Hupp made to Betsy at 7.27 p.m. You called her when you got home? I'm trying to think which one I called. I called Betsy to tell her I was home. Home is O'Fallon, Missouri. Cell phone records show that 7.27 call pinged north of Troy in this area of the Faria home. I talked to Hupp at her house right after the trial. I asked her if she remembered hearing Betsy's phone ring when her daughter was calling. Betsy doesn't not pick up many calls. Right, so I was she just wondering why she didn't pick up those. That I can't answer. Maybe either we were in her bedroom then. I don't know. I don't know where her phone was. I never even heard any calls. I don't know if I left right before she got a call. I don't know. Like I told them, I wasn't expecting for police to come to my door that next morning. So I wasn't taking notes. Go back. She also sounded uncertain during this videotaped re-interview about how she left Betsy. I think originally you told investigators that when you left, Betsy was laying on the couch. Is that correct? I know she was on the couch because she was put. She was going to put in a movie. She was going to watch a movie. It happened really fast. Mm -hmm. All that happened really fast. And I'm used to her walking to me door. Maybe sure. not. But I want to say today she did. But okay. Maybe she still was on the couch. Okay. She was often on the couch. The only female DNA found at the scene was Betsy's. DNA testing revealed Betsy's blood on the murder weapon. The DNA lab report continues. Russell Faria is excluded as the source of these profiles. Blood on the light switch came back, a mixture of at least two individuals, at least one of which is male. The report continues that it's Betsy's blood, but that Russell Faria is excluded as the major contributor. Minor contributors are weak and incomplete. When talking to Hupp at her door, she told me the major case squad did not seize much from her, except this list of clothing she told detectives she was wearing. And they took the clothing you said you wore. Right. And then they, they looked at, they, did they look at the car? Um, I don't know if they did or not. It was outside. I mean, it was parked right in my driveway. Did they spray luminol on your car or your husband's car? No. After this interview with Hupp, I just want your initial thoughts. We found the family on the flyer Hupp reportedly handed okay. out. Wow, that's our Christmas card. Whew, that's that's really it's kind of scary. James Murphy is the man in that flyer, seeing for the first time his Christmas card, photocopy, he says, without his permission. I have no idea where she came up with some of this stuff. We found Murphy while following a lead apparently overlooked by investigators. To me, in my world, 150000 is not that much. Court records show that Hupp claimed she did not need money and even once gave fifty grand to a family battling cancer. This interview may be the first time anyone's followed up. It never got back to you. Nobody ever said, hey, what's... I'm really surprised that um, that we haven't been. I mean, it's uh, doing something like this, um, it's, it's taking a big chance, I would think, that somebody didn't con contact us. He says the story is not true. In this line, Laura's last Christmas. She still had time. She still had time. Um, she was sick, but no, it's this, 
I have no idea why she would say this is Laura's last Christmas. So if you had seen that at the time, that would hurt. It would. It would really would. She had two Christmases. His wife died a year and a half later. James Murphy said Hupp regularly took his wife out while she underwent chemo, but never said anything about a fundraiser, and he never saw a dime. To make a case against Russ Faria, prosecutors made surprising new allegations and closing statements. They convinced a jury this was an evil plan, plotted by five people playing a fantasy role play game. You'll hear from all four of the fantasy game players who are now challenging prosecutors and police. Come and get them if prosecutors really believe they're not telling the truth about the night of the murder. We're not going to let our friend go away up the river for something he didn't do, not without yelling and screaming about it. A Lincoln County jury convicted Russ Faria for stabbing his wife 55 times and leaving a steak knife buried in her neck. The reason? Prosecutors say it was the ultimate role play drawn up years earlier by a group of gamers. Every one of those gamers have now come forward challenging prosecutors. Set an innocent man free or come after them. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, from uh, reading uh, the stories in the newspaper, from seeing the stuff online, hearing things on the news, it was pretty damning. Since Russ Faria's arrest in 2011, these four people yeah, thought they could have been sitting right like next that. to a murderer. All you're hearing is, uh, and we were hearing from investigators, open and shut case. Michael Corbin, yeah. Angelia Hewley, and yeah. Brandon Sweeney, and Marshall Bach yeah. all told detectives they were with Russ Faria from 6 to 9 p.m. the night Betsy was murdered. For the longest time, like I even said, uh, I thought Russ did it before he came out and hung out with us. Then they learned at trial, prosecutors narrowed Betsy's time of death to a time between 7.20 and 9.41 p.m. Even convict Russ Faria's attorney says he did not know prosecutors would suddenly accuse cooperating witnesses. The state alleged that four innocent people conspired in murder. If these people aren't innocent, then why aren't they charged? Uh, bigger question is why won't the state go on record and say that to you? Because there's nothing to support it just like there's nothing to support that Russell Free had anything to do with this. In closing arguments at trial, Lincoln County Prosecutor Leah Askey called Betsy's murder the ultimate role play. Askey told jurors Russ Faria brought a murder plot to his friends. She said they all set up the alibi, using Brandon Sweeney to play a key role. Askey suggested Sweeney kept Russ's cell phone so that it would ping in O'Fallon at 8.57 p.m. She said Sweeney then drove through the Arby's to get this receipt stamped 909 so that Russ could kill his wife 30 minutes away. That really sickens my stomach because I tried to help him the whole time, uh, be honest and truthful, tr just trying to find what happened that night, to be honest with you. If we're guilty of something, we should be arrested. Leah Askey, probably in particular, is not going to like what we're doing here. But we don't want to be here. It made me sick. <laughs> it really did. I just, I, I just can't believe it. I just, I didn't think things like that happened. Faith in the justice system and authority figures, there is no faith in them anymore. You see something like this happen, I don't know, you, know, you almost go around town wondering like, who's gonna try to screw me over? It almost makes you second guess working with authorities. I don't wanna be having to talk to you as nice as a guy as you are, Chris, but Leah Askey put us here by saying that our friend committed a crime that he could not possibly have committed. I mean, he was within eight foot of us that night. There is no way he committed this crime. Police report finding no blood on Russ Faria. A crime lab report shows DNA testing revealed Betsy's blood on the murder weapon. The DNA lab report continues. Russell Faria is excluded as the source of these profiles. I made repeated attempts to get answers from Prosecutor Askey, even writing the Attorney General's office, which assisted in convicting Russ Faria. Askey finally responded with this email. I cannot comment on anything regarding this case until all of the defendant's appeals have been exhausted. I have stated this every way possible on numerous occasions. I appreciate your zeal. However, this will serve as my answer to all such questions and future inquiries. This is just the beginning of our co-investigation with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Robert, tell me about this phone call a juror received right after the verdict. Well, one of the jurors was on his way home from the trial, and he got a call from a friend of his who said, let me tell you, that guy's innocent. Who was this, and what was that about? She's an employee in the courthouse. She sat through part of the trial, and as he described it to me, she saw what the jurors weren't allowed to see. And what was he thinking when he heard this from this woman? 
I think it kind of blew him away, and, and I think he's been thinking about it a lot. He's, um, it's, it's brought up some issues that he has with the justice system. He's sort of hoping that they got the right guy, but he's also glad that there's an appeal, and he's glad that somebody's looking into it. Tell me about the first vote coming out of closing statements. Yeah, as soon as the jurors went back, they voted, and it was 6-6. And what changed that? About four hours of talking. You know, they did discuss another suspect, um, somebody that, that it, it was clear to jurors that, um, that Russ's lawyer was pointing at somebody else. They discussed that person, um, and one of the jurors told me that he essentially talked them out of it. What was it that made them feel good about their final decision? Well, the three jurors that I was able to reach and talk to all didn't believe his alibi. They also mentioned the fact that 55 stab wounds indicates rage. I said, there's rage there. A lot of the jurors couldn't get past the bloody slippers, and they couldn't get past what police said was, a, was some indication that there was a trail of blood leading to a kitchen drawer. What did one of the jurors say about an appeal and how that weighed in on their decision? Well, one of the jurors said that they knew there was going to be an appeal and that eased their mind somewhat in coming to a final decision that, they, that, that, that essentially it would be reviewed. So what happens next? Who will play the key role in fighting the appeal as our Fox 2 St. Louis Post-Dispatch investigation continues? I know that I'm innocent. Um, Mr. Schwartz has told me, you know, he knows in his, in his mind and in his heart that I'm innocent. Russ Freya's attorney filed an appeal. We asked the Attorney General's office to comment because an assistant AG helped in prosecution. The office declined to comment and will handle the appeal. Thanks for joining us on our Fox 2 St. Louis Post-Dispatch joint investigation. Keep the conversation going on Twitter using the hashtag FreeAMurder and count on us for new developments.